and sent. And um, as I've said all along, uh, certainly if there's something uh, that you'd like to share with us about you, that's an interesting factor. You certainly uh, can share with us now, but the floor is yours. Um, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. The difficulty is I have two screens and you need to bring the other screen up for me to get my audio. Okay. Have, have my other screen join the chat. I mean, join the chat channel because I have to mute this one. Okay, I don't think I have that ability from my end. Um, hold on, Mary. What's that? Yeah, I understood that you could bring it in. You could do it from your side. When I came on five hours ago, I had both of them up, remember? But you couldn't see me, so I took one out. Yeah. So she brings the other one back into this screen, and I'll be able to do it. Oh. Yeah, I, as I said, um, the, our, the site was hacked, all right? So as a consequence, we have really lost uh, the ability to do that. Um, so you could go ahead and speak and we could do the best that we can do with your presentation. Okay, go ahead, Prophet. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. We're hearing you. Wait a second, let me come out of the other one. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we could hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. I all my stuff uh, rigged up together, but anyway. <laughs> so um, I've been here, of course, since the beginning, and uh, I was invited probably 40 minutes before your program started. So I did not have a prepared um, presentation, but I've learned a lot since I've been here. I was invited by someone that I do mental health work with. I am, so what were your questions for me? You wanted me to do some specific things, something about myself? Eric? Can you hear me, Eric? You had some questions for me. I see Mary, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Prophet. Okay, well, let me just tell you about myself. He asked me something specific, but anyway, um, I'm a licensed registered nurse with over 40 years of experience specializing in mental health, complementary, alternative, and integrative uh, therapies, addiction, trauma, death, and dying, and life transitions. I'm also an ordained minister and a holistic practitioner with over eight, 30 years of service service, engagement, advocacy, education, life skills, coaching with populations of diverse ages, ethnicities, socioeconomic backgrounds, and gender in communities primarily across the United States, as well as opportunities in India, UK, Africa, Jamaica. Recently with Haiti, we've been doing some mental health work and healing with um, uh, Haitian Americans, as well as the refugees still in Haiti who are all survivors of kidnapping, also uh, African refugees who escaped Kenya, and then also some work in Canada. Uh, I just per, on a personal, more personal level, I'm in Stuart Elder with the African American Council of Elders in Wichita, Kansas, and also in Stuart Elder with the National Black Council of Elders um, on the steering committee. I'm one of 15 African Americans, one of two females that were appointed to the 400 years of African American History Commission pursuant to public law 115-102. I'm the chair or the lead for the Education and Outreach Subcommittee for the International Civil Society Working Group for the United per, uh, Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. And the, that permanent forum, uh, Mr. Daniels just mentioned, will be launching uh, December 5th through the 8th in Geneva, Switzerland. I am also an affiliate member of the Association of Black Psychologists and their uh, national program for uh, healing circles. I'm a trained Salbona Ubuntu and Emotional Manifestation Healing Circle, uh, which they were created by the Association of Black Psychologists and the Community Healing Network. They offer culturally specific intergenerational healing circles for persons of African ancestry. 
And we do those with people in other parts of the world and tailor them to that specific culture. For example, example with Haiti, because they have uh, those that speak English and some that speak uh, uh, French Creole, then we were able to adapt them for, for the needs that they're having, which right now is very severe trauma. I'm also the co-founder of Safe Healthy Spaces Kansas, which offers sacred healing spaces specifically designed for diverse population and their allies. So that's just a little bit about me. I, I, I think there was something else he asked, but I think that's it. So the uh, what I can offer, considering I did not prepare a presentation, I was just asked to be on. And, uh, but since I've been listening for the last five hours, I've got a lot and I've taken a lot of, a lot of notes on uh, what was said. So primarily the work we do addresses um, trauma and the um, Dr. Mary, Dr. Rose, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rose mentioned the uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, which of course many of the black psychologists now term post-traumatic slave disorder. Someone even called it. <laughs> because, yeah, because our, our yeah. centuries. Yeah. And during the, um, coming out of the Jewish Holocaust, when we had our own Holocaust, it, we called the Mayafa, but coming out of the Jewish Holocaust that the scientists discovered that there were children and grandchildren of those in the Jewish Holocaust who were still suffering from the effects of their ancestors. So realizing that they began to take um, a little deeper dive into what about people of African descent who had gone through centuries, centuries of uh, trauma around kidnapping. We had our own um, trail of tears coming out of Africa. As you know, not everybody was living on the coast. And so we had to go across a lot of territory to get to where a uh, slave port was, as well as uh, uh, slave ships. And then coming from there across the ocean and, and uh, packed in, in ships and all that happened there, then arriving here, of course, with, with <laughs> a couple of years, having a hundred years of lynching, that over a hundred years of lynching, there, there was an attempt to pass a law, the uh, anti-lynching law, because for whatever reason, we needed a special law to end lynching of people of African descent because the, um, it wasn't illegal. So anyway, but just because of all those things and a lot of work has been done. The other thing with the, uh, some of those uh, black psychologists out there, which I have a, a great regard for, and um, is that to, just to tell their story real quick, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a registered nurse with uh, over 30 years as a psychiatric and mental health nurse. So I, I worked and I used to wonder years ago, I saw Native Americans who would say that they needed to bring their culture to bear back in the 80s when I was working to bear their ceremonies, their rituals, their culture, to bear in terms of alcoholism. And way back then, I wondered, well, why don't we have something? You know, we had all these people of African descent coming into uh, detox and recovery and all that and, and, uh, and rehab, but we didn't have anything specific for us. And so as it turns out, when I got in touch with the, or uh, uh, found out about the Black Psychologists Community Healing Network, and those who were scholars who were looking into these things, when they first started studying, they only had the um, American Psychological Association, I think that's the name of it. But anyway, those, that was the group who had pioneered uh, psychiatry and mental health for people all over the world. And so based on their belief, people of African descent start, were already inferior. So that's my caution when it comes to doctor, when it comes to this mental health piece for, for black folks is because they had, they even had diagnosis in the, in the MS, I don't know if it's MS, it used to be M, MSD, um, what was it, MS? But when I was really doing it way back when it was four or five, I think it's probably 15 or something now, but the categories they had included a mental disease, mental health illness for people who wanted to escape slavery. So when they came back, they had special institutions for colored people who wanted to be free. They had to be crazy or insane if they wanted to be free from slavery. So there <laughs> was always something off about their psychology when it came to us. So when the um, uh, young men who pioneered like the AB Psy some 60 or more years ago went to college and found they wanted to be psychologists, but they, the way they tell the story, and I can't tell it just like they tell it, but they found, wait a minute, they met together and said, wait a minute, we're missing somewhere in these books. We're missing in, in what they're teaching. And so do we stay in school? What do we do? And so they opted to stay. 
the advocate state and out of their education and their PhD and their research, they develop scholarship to support who we are as a people, not inferior, define the lie that we're inferior, define the lie that white is a superior, that's the lie. And so that's the work of many of us who really work in this particular area is to make sure, and going back to everything I've heard today, the, the starting with the question that was raised by Eric or Mary, the whole concept around some of this, even with the political pieces, as I was taking notes on it, is that what about Africa and how does Africa go free? How, what do they do to get to a level of autonomy, uh, build infrastructure, get financially solvent and all these things? And I reflect back on conversations that I've had this week. And so I took a note where I put, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? So, <laughs> you know, based on conversations I've had with different people and some reading we were doing this week, uh, the Ashanti uh, people sold some Africans in exchange for guns. Africans, you know, that were enslaved with them, you know, naturally not knowing the horrific uh, treatment they'd have, but they, the fact is they still sold them. And so somewhere we had Africans doing war, you know, getting each other as um, uh, thinking of each other as different in different groups, selling and exchanging and taking into, into uh, captivity. But then it wound up in the hands of people of the colonizers. So, so the way I summarize is Africans sold other Africans, colonizers came in, and the colonizers came in, they enslaved and, you know, and put everybody in bondage. Wow. And then when they came in and took control of the resources <laughs> of the land, then um, we look up and we have enslaved people, we have the enslavers in America, we have the colonizers around the world. And then as we go on, and I heard the stories of uh, uh, Uganda and DRC, let me back up a minute. I have not been, I've been a, the parts of Africa, I've been to India, but I hearing the stories of uh, DRC, I just met some people on Zoom from the DRC, so I didn't know these stories that they were going through. I knew that the Belgian uh, government had gone in and had set up a system where Africans were uh, mutilating and amputating limbs of people in the Congo because they wanted them to work the mines. So somewhere between the colonizers and the enslavers, and the uh, first slaving selling of Africans by Africans, it had gotten to a point that Africans then were doing more harm to each other and the enslavers didn't even have to show up. Seeing that in South Africa right now, the femi femi what do they call it? femicide in South Africa, the death of African women at the hands of the murder is at the hands of black men, no longer the apartheid rules. So somehow all of it, it has changed hands. So we start with, African civil Africans, colonizers came in, and slavers came in. Mm -hmm. Africans they began, began to do um, greater harm to each other. And while they were busy doing greater harm, we talked here about the Uganda and Rwanda and DRC. And so while we're looking at all this stuff, a new colonizer's in. They're already in the door. The ship has already set, uh, sailed on the fact. So, and I won't call them by name on this because I don't want to get in trouble, but there's a new colonizer. And they're doing a lot of somebody mentioned it. There's, they kind of uh, uh, hinted at the fact, and that's why I really like what Maurice was saying, and I'm hoping to get his contact information. The other gentleman who was kind of stopped at one point, several people hinted at the fact that there's a hidden hand somewhere. And so as we work on these issues and we struggle and wonder after 400, 500 years, why are they still shooting us in the street? And that's the thing I guess that troubles me the most is I have these conversations and people are saying why they, they're doing this and people are disappointed. Black people disappointed why they're still doing it. Of course they are. And those who do mental health know that when we get people into treatment, it takes time and treatment and still sometimes people don't recover. But we don't count kidnapping and lynching for a hundred years plus and not calling it a crime until you get a law. We don't count that as insanity. We count what happens with Black people in our communities as somehow mental health issues. And so there's, some, there's an issue with the system. And someone alluded to that. There's a, a hidden hand somewhere that somebody's supporting Rwanda, somebody's supporting the corrupt leaders, somebody somewhere who's getting a great benefit is supporting these systems. And so what we do anyway, we don't get into all of that. But since I was going to have a few minutes, I thought I'd just put all this out here because you may not ever invite me back again, but this is my opportunity to put it out there, that there's problem in the land because there's a new colonizer and they're well-rooted. They have armies, they have nuclear weapons 
and they have the ability to take a whole up, uh, go a lot deeper than the last colonizer. So what is Africa going to do? So what I heard today is Africa is going to build this African infrastructure investment bank and build it on debt. Now I'm a Christian, but I'm also a sect again that I honor other religions, but I'm gonna pull something from the Christian Bible that says the debtor is the slave. And so how is it that people come in, rape and pillage and steal assets out of Africa, and then the solution that Africa is going to come up with is to go back to them and get debt from them so that we owe them. And so when we default on that, then they get some more stuff. I mean, somehow I'm just hoping that we're able to have a separate form on this because it's not logical. It's not logical to think that the people who drug us out of Africa now after 400 years, and we're surprised that they shot somebody. They had 100 years of lynching. I think, and Mr. Daines will know this, I think they just passed the anti-lynching law last year. And so how is it? So we, we have some thinking. And so part of what the scholars do, and I'm not speaking for them, because some of what I'm saying, probably a lot of folks will be, say, you know, have an issue with, but I'm just putting it out there because I got a minute to do so, that we need to shift our thinking, this idea that we're waiting for somebody to shift their thinking and get mentally healthy enough to care about the human race that, that they're benefiting from. I think it's a little bit naive. And so we just need to, for Africa, I'm saying we have to unite. I would wanted to say we need to unite. And I'm saying we, because we're from the continent and we're looking to you all because we want mother Africa. We want our culture. We want our names. We want all that stuff. But then when I, I just a few months ago got on some platforms and I'm hearing from South Africa and I'm hearing from Kenya and I'm hearing from, I'm, I'm hearing horrors all over the place that I'm looking as a diaspora person to go to Africa to find the richness that I've learned about in the books and the ancient Kemet and all the pyramids. And I'm finding what? The greatest murders of black women in South Africa is black men, that they're raping women and elders and leaving them and be, something has to happen. So yes, that's, those are mental health issues. However, in order to solve some of those, um, we've got to get a handle one on unity across Africa. And when I look at the fact that maybe even before the colonizer came, that didn't exist. I was told by a professor in South Africa that even, I said, where are the watchers on the wall? If we go to the spiritual piece of it and all the spiritual, where are the healers? Where are those spiritual people with sight? Where are they at? Why didn't they know? I'm a prophet and I'm called by, by God to, to, you know, to, to call the, you know, put the call out there that something's coming. Well, it's already here. But in the Old Testament, in every cult, every religion, there were people who would say, just watch, something is happening. Where are they? Well, this one um, professor said, well, actually, I was glad a month or so ago, he shared this, that they, there was a person in South Africa who knew who saw it, but he came up with a solution for the, for the guns. He had a way to somehow, um, this, I don't know if it's dismantled, but he had a way to put a stop to the harm the guns were going to do. He had invented something. But the reason I why- I apologize, the, Prophet, uh, one more minute, please. Okay, I'll wrap it up. The reason why they didn't listen to him is because he wasn't part of their ethnic group. So that's how they fell into that. So let me just give you, so I got one minute. I'm gonna tell you, if you wanted, you're doing this uh, infrastructure investment bank, look at the Asian infrastructure investment bank, see how many African leaders have already signed on to it. All of the US allies signed on to it. Look at the CIPS system, which is working in parallel the US SWIFT system. Look at the whole history of central banks around the world because Andrew Jackson, all the presidents that were mentioned earlier, Andrew Jackson was not mentioned. He did not want the national bank in our country here because every place they went, they brought destruction. So in 1913, one president let them in, but all across the globe, these, these banks are all debt-based and debt simply means that you'll be old, have a debt that you have to pay. And right now that's not, well, I'm just giving you some stuff to look up. Look it up, have some young people look it up and don't just look up the part that sounds positive for the West. Get some young people who are willing to dig, dig into the side that you may not be happy about or popular with. Look at the damage the central banks have done. Figure out how to get the resources back in Africa's hand. You don't need debt because you're standing on richness. Why do debt and let them keep the diamonds and the gold and the cobalt and make AI and all that? Get to figure out how to get those resources back because you don't need debt. That's okay. So that's my minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Well, a good book on that, I think, is The Creature from Jekyll Island, yes. in terms of how the National Reserve Bank was uh, created. Uh, well, Prophet, we thank you so much. Um, there's a lot taking place in Africa. Africa is on the move. Yes. And um, I know that um, our good 